We're all about making the world of work work better for people. And my role as CFO touches really on all aspects of finance. Gina Mastantuono, the Chief Financial Officer of ServiceNow. What does a CFO actually do? If you think about accounting, risk, compliance, um, FP&A, tax and treasury, investor relations, procurement, um, also workplace services. So everything about the workplace. I'm also responsible for driving our global impact strategy across the company. So those are the main aspects of what I'm responsible for. But also it's about working closely with all of my peers across the C-suite particularly our chief strategy officer, Nick Sitson on strategy and M&A, as well as our CIO, Chris Betty, to really focus and enact digital transformation in initiatives, help plan a safe uh, return to work for our employees, and, and, t- and tons more, as you can imagine. You know, we have this image of the historical traditional CIO as kind of like an advanced accountant bean counter, you know, with the green eye shade. And yet you're talking about digital transformation. And I know that there's the uh, innovation role as well. So what's going on with the CIO role and how accurate is that green eye shade image? CFO is the image that you are uh, talking about as the bean counter, right? And it's a Definitely an outdated image, and I'm I'm definitely not um, the typical image of a CFO. Uh, we are really no longer just being counters with a fierce grip on the checkbook. Right now, a major growth driver for many companies is digital transformation, and CFOs are playing a key role in not just enabling that transformation, but driving it. And being a CFO today is all about strategy, understanding those growth levers that drive the business and the investments that are needed to get us where we need to go. But it's also about leadership. Gone are the days when all leaders needed was a strong IQ. Today's leaders really need to have a high level of EQ as well. They need to lead with compassion and empathy. Um, And especially in today's COVID-19 environment, leaders must ask every day how they're helping employees navigate the new normal. You know, I'm slightly taken aback in a way Uh, to hear you talk about leadership, empathy, driving digital transformation. Again, because I have in the back of my mind this stereotype of the traditional CFO. So what, I guess we could say your role is it's it's a leadership role with the emphasis on uh, the finances and investing. Is that an accurate way to say it? Absolutely. I think the leadership piece is so important and the role of the CFO really has evolved um, over the last five, 10 years. And even in the last year, um, you know, COVID-19 has really elevated the CFO role. We're playing a pivotal role in guiding organizations through the crisis. Um, We're central to the strategic decision, the decisions that are going to help our companies not only survive the current climate, but come out stronger on the other side. And what I think is especially interesting is that we now must have a stronger understanding of technology. And this is especially apparent after COVID-19. Instead of delegating down all the technology work, CFOs are spending more time actually learning it. Um, If you think about all the data that we have, CFOs have to become immensely data-driven and we're using predictive and analytics, for example, and machine learning to really ensure that our initiatives are driving real impact. In fact, I was actually recently talking with our CIO, Chris Betty, about the shifting paradigm. For so long, CIOs were told they needed to be more business savvy, but today it's really the rest of the C-suite that needs to become more comfortable with technology because technology is becoming the business as more companies must really pivot their business models in order to continue to compete and be disruptive in the current landscape. We have a question from Twitter from Arsalan Khan, who's a regular listener. And Arsalan, thank you. He always asks such great questions. And he says, how should a CFO balance between uh, digital transformation goals and operational requirements. And he's an enterprise architect. And so he also wants to know, do CIOs really need to report to the CFO? 
But let's let's take the first one first. The first question first. How do you balance digital transformation strategy against the operational needs? In this day and age, it's hard to separate the two, right? Did did digital transformation is going to help drive the operations of the company. And as we are thinking about a more distributed workplace, technology is really the, the, the enabler of operations, whether it's front office or back office. And so I think it's hard to split the two. And the CFOs who are leaning in and understanding that, I think are going to have the most success um, because I think it's all very intertwined right now. The other the other question about does a CIO have to report into the CFO? I don't think it has to. We don't have that structure um, at ServiceNow, but I work very closely and partner very closely with, with our CIO on all aspects of digital tra- transformation, of course. Why? Why do you partner so closely with him? Why is that particular relationship so important to you? I think at the end of the day, so much of what we're doing and so much of what we're trying to lean in on digital transformation, if you don't have alignment with that CIO really, really early in the process, you're not going to enable the great outcomes that I know that we need to achieve. And so that alignment is especially critical today, more so than ever. And, um, you know, I'm really, really blessed and lucky that I have such an incredible CIO like Chris And we partner really from from the get-go before we even budget for projects. We talk about what the business needs are and what business um, challenge we're trying to solve. And then we work together to ensure, A, that we have the investment dollars required, that we have the, the bandwidth of the people. Because one piece of it is investment dollars. The other piece of it is making sure that you have the capacity internally to drive it, right? And so... If you're funding things and the, the, the company is not ready to manage it, then it's a waste of money. So really understanding that from the get-go. And then on the, op, on the other side, when we're finalizing, making sure that we're really um, you know, holding the organization accountable for, those, um, for the ROI, for the outcomes that we talked about at the beginning of, of the project. And so working together from start to finish is really going to help that. So you are working carefully, closely with him during the, basically the underlying, looking at the underlying strategy, what are we trying to achieve? And then all the way through the the kind of operational planning and setup? Yes, exactly. And all the way to the end to managing the outcomes and, 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 and ensuring that we're getting the outcomes that we expect from these projects upfront. I can easily see that that would be a very successful way of working because you've got tech, you've got technology execution and finance in lockstep from the way the project is constructed based on the business needs all the way through to to the end. Exactly. I mean, the CFO and CIO, that relationship, it's it's the connective tissue really that helps organizations see around the curve to predict some of these issues, to understand what we need to do in the future. Um, you know, it drives value cross-functionally and across the different organizations within the company. And it really, you know, we are pushing our teams to be more collaborative, right? If you're not working across um, the company and you're just focused on one area, you're not going to have the great outcomes that digital transformation can actually drive. So then a big part of this as well is there's kind of a natural breaking down of silos by that partnership you've been describing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and it needs to, th- those silos have to be breaking, broken down if you're really looking for successful digital tra- transformation. Gina, you have called the CFO the chief transformation officer. What did you mean by that? In this new world where we see COVID, um, it's really elevated the role um, of CFO. And I talk about chief transformation officer because I think we have one of the most impactful roles in really enabling that transformation both quickly and effectively. And CFOs, you talked about it earlier, right? You talked about that that, that image of the bean counter. Well, we used to get the reputation of instinctively saying no 
to new technologies and change and new investments, really effectively, you know, stymieing the growth of the company. But instead of being a roadblock or gatekeeper, CFOs are really becoming an accelerant of impactful change, which I think has been especially true during COVID. And so I think that we have a unique perspective and a unique ability to really help drive it as opposed to being that roadblock. You know, it's funny to hear you describe it that way because the CIO CIO role has also been described as, you know, the keeper of no. Is there a cultural change that has to take place for a chief financial officer to adopt this kind of innovation forward mindset that you've just been describing? I think it's happening. I think it's happened already. I, you know, I think that finance has been and needs to make innovation a priority. And, and I think most CFOs have seen that, um, you know, the companies that are choosing to hoard their resources and not invest, I think are the ones who are going to have a real problem coming out of this crisis stronger. Um, you know, investing in R&D, investing in these types of di- digital efforts and digitization, it not only improves their products, but also helps develop new offerings, new business models. If you think about Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, they're all companies who've achieved sustained success by making innovation an imperative. And it really helps result in new products, new services, and, re- and, and revenue st- streams. We, we talk about the example of Disney Plus all the time, If you right? Theme parks, movie theaters, everything closed. Um, but if, had they not invested prior to COVID in what they needed to do for, di- for Disney Plus, they'd be in a very different spot today. And so um, the best CFOs today, I think, are really taking a focus on and understanding the balance between investment in innovation and weighing that really strongly against the cost. And it's not just, I think it's a culture shift to your point, Michael, that's here already. We have another question uh, from LinkedIn this time, a really interesting one. And this is from Simone Jo Moore. And she says, as a leader, how do you draw in collaboration across silos when teams have incentives to do their own thing. And there's also just the natural propensity of some people. They're not comfortable with that kind of cross-team collaboration. So how do you do it? And I hope I've summarized her question correctly. Building relationships within the organization, not just within your teams, just becomes more and more, more and more important. And I think as you rise as a leader. And it goes back to my first point I made earlier on the, the, the EQ being as important as the IQ um, is becoming more and more important. And I think building those relationships and understanding that collaborating cross-functionally is the best way to ensure the, the right and the best outcomes, um, I think is, is a huge part of the future of leadership and the future of CFOs and how they think. Um, I think the key is to never lose sight of the bigger picture and to always know that people are coming to work to do their best job and their best work every day. And so to put yourself in their shoes and to think about collaboration in a, in an empathetic way, Um, as opposed to just focusing on what you need to do to get your job done, but understanding that if you're helping others achieve their goals, you're going to all get to a better place and really achieving the wider company goals. Does that make sense, Michael? It makes perfect sense. So again, it sounds like your North Star always is the underlying business strategy and then the pieces that fall into play, including finance, uh, support that business strategy. And so you approach it from that leadership standpoint. Absolutely. And by the way, we, you, you have to do that because if you're not doing that, then if everything becomes a priority, then nothing's a priority, right? We hear that all the time. And so if, you, if you're able to go back to the, st- the strategy and what you're trying to achieve as a company, uh, I think that has to be the, nor- the North Star for all CFOs. Absolutely. 
On Twitter, Mike Sanchez says, how can a CFO balance the pressure of enabling rapid growth without the company getting too far in front of their skis? And how does this vary by sector? I think the question is is really about the balance between investment and innovation against kind of, you know, how how do you make sure from a profitability perspective, you're not getting out in front of your skis. And so I think, I think one of the keys is to never lose sight of the bigger picture and see if those, while they're always focused on the numbers, obviously, um, especially reducing expenses. Sometimes if they, if they don't think about innovation, they can really miss out on opportunities by staying on the sidelines. We are, we are really lucky at ServiceNow. We have um, we have what we call NowX is our um, incubation hub for new innovation and technology that we actually anticipate will generate a hundred plus million in annual uh, contract value revenue coming up. And so we've we, we're introducing new verticals and new products. And in 2022, we'll continue to, indus- to, to introduce new industries. And we've built this whole NowX um, incubation organically. Um, and so because we've been able to innovate organically on one platform, as opposed to uh, lots of acquisitions, it actually enables us to drive more leverage in the business. And it's one of the reasons why ServiceNow has such an incredible profitability um, uh, mo- model. And so... Modern CFOs, I think, are really learning that they need to understand the importance of continuous innovation and really, really thinking about these digitization projects through the lens of maximizing value to the business. And I think there's more upside to growing the pie versus saving each crumb. And so we think about R&D investments in a couple of different buckets. And I think it, it, it helps me to think about it th- this way. And we have We have R&D, for example, we call Horizon One, when we expect um, to see ROI on those investments within a year. And that's about 60% of our spend. Um, Then we have Horizon Two, and that's emerging technologies and new new products for future growth, right? And we expect to see ROI in one to three years. And that's about 30% of our spend. But then we have this Horizon Three, right? It's future bets on... Uh, next generation uh, technologies for future growth. And we hope to see ROI on that in three to five years. And that's about 10% of our spend. But we need to be really comfortable sometimes as CFOs understanding that not that we need to experiment and not every, not every project is, is going to yield the ROI that you anticipate. And you need to give the company some freedom to be able to do that. Now, if you're, uh, if you're collaborating cross-functionally, like I talked about earlier, and really working across the C-suite with your CIOs and your chief revenue officer and your chief product officers, you're really able to ensure that you're more comfortable making those bets and experimenting. It sounds like uh, you have, in your role as CFO, you've been able to introduce a certain kind of discipline to help balance the crucial importance, especially for a technology company, of near-term, mid-term, and then farther, longer-out innovation against the equally important requirement of financial restraint. So it sounds like you've been very disciplined balancing these. It's part of the job, for sure. I think that I am also super blessed to have an incredible um, executive leadership team who, who understands that balance as well. And it, it's, it's also a different conversation at a high growth technology company like ServiceNow. There's not a whole lot of tension because technology is what we sell. So we have to invest. But for CFOs at other companies, I think the tension is actually much, much harder. And if I think about industries where I came from, my past experiences with um, much different profit margin type of companies, tech distribution, consumer goods, media, for example. And at those companies, the the R&D investments don't always hit the top line immediately. And it becomes a lot about cost savings and productivity. But as IT becomes the business, more and more 
regardless of what industry you're in, as every company becomes a software company, CFOs have really got to start thinking differently about the investment in R&D and technology than they even did just one and two years ago. And so if you think about customer and employee experience, as that becomes more and more critical, technology investments will remain more important to ensure you're protecting your top line as well as growing it. And so I think that, again, it comes back to the overarching strategy. And so that discipline um, is always in, in full view of a CFO, but I actually think that more CFOs are leaning in to um, investing more than ever before, really as a function of, of, of the challenging climate. And I think it's super important that the CFO play the role in aligning the organization um, and the organization's culture so that it's not dominated by the efficiency experts looking for cost reductions or the innovation halls who only want top line. There does really need to be a balance and everyone needs to be on the same page, right? And so at ServiceNow, we've been able to balance that growth and profitability. And I think the sustained strength of our top line growth is really the result of consistent execution across the, the, across the organization, from our sales teams to our engineers, to our uh, customer success teams, and everyone in between. That alignment is so, so important. And I will say to my many CIO friends that if your, CI, if your CFO has these kinds of inclinations, I'm sure you're doing this already, but being friends with her or him is probably not, not a bad idea because that balance, striking that balance between the need for innovation and fiscal responsibility and to do it in a way that's, that's reasonable, I mean, what a great, what a great thing. For, for both the, for the tech people, for, for the whole company. That's why that relationship between CFO and CIO is so important. I completely agree, Michael. We have an, another question from Twitter, and the questions are starting to stack up now. And this is from Greg Hauser, who says, who asks, what is the CFO's role in creating a culture that prioritizes talent? Talent is a huge pillar of our overarching strategy. And so when we talked earlier, Michael, about everything aligning to the global strategy at ServiceNow, we have five pillars and our people and talent are one of the five pillars. And we actually, I actually, in, in, in my finance organization, I put it as the center pillar because I think it's critical, right? And so we, we say teamwork makes the dream work here. And it's about not only recruiting incredible talent, but retaining, developing, and ensuring that we are, that we are, you know, developing the leaders of the future. And so I think it's a critical aspect of what CFOs have to be focused on today, always. Bhagarath Kumar later asks, should RPA initiatives uh, start with a center of excellence or should we just start with individual use cases? And I think it doesn't have to be just RPA. I think any kind of technology. Do you start by building the center of excellence and building up that, that talent? Or do you try sort of ad hoc use cases? What's the best approach? It depends on the organization, right? And so I can tell you that um, at my prior employer, we started out with use cases, but then we're building up a small center of, of excellence to manage it. Because if you don't do that, then you're going to be reliant on consultants. And that's, well, I love my consultants, don't get me wrong. Um, when you're really thinking about digital transformation and automation, you want to be able to manage that internally. And so I think that how I've done it in the past is specific use cases to start, make sure it makes sense. Um, but then build up a small, not enormous, but a small center of excellence. But every company is different and every culture is different. I think it really depends, but, that, but that's worked for me in the past. Arsalan Khan says, if people are as productive at home as they are in the office, then why is there a push to go back to the office? And he says, is this a CapEx issue? For example, real estate? Is it something else? And why aren't companies thinking more about remote and cloud first as we transition back to this next economy? 
most companies are thinking about this in a, it, I, I know it's service now, it's something I, we, we think about and talk about every day. Um, I don't think it's a real estate issue. I think the issue is productivity and culture, right? Maintaining the culture. It's ensuring that um, the early in career folks are able to continue to develop and learn. I know when I learned coming up through the ranks, a lot of it was the in-person interaction that I had with leaders, right? And so I think the debate right now is not, I think there's a huge debate. And I actually think that the future of work is going to be much more hybrid um, than, than ever before. I don't know that it's going to be 100% remote. I think that there's a, there, there are roles where 100% re- remote makes a lot of sense. But I do think that, and I certainly see this at ServiceNow, that a lot of people are missing that interaction of being in the office and those conversations that happened as you were passing each other um, in the hallway, that piece is missing. Um, And so we're experimenting with many different ways of working. We are absolutely talking about return to work because by the way, there's a lot of employees that want to come back to, to the office. They feel more productive in the office. And so we're about thinking about how to, how to make everyone more productive. And so we want to give people the option of returning to the office, being hybrid, working remote. But I absolutely think that the future of work is going to be much more of a hybrid model, a distributed workforce when And if that's the case, digital transformation becomes even more important than ever, right? Because how do we ensure productivity, collaboration? How do we ensure that culture remains intact? We're going to have to have these incredible digital tools help us through that. And so I think more companies than you think of are actually thinking about how to do things differently. And I think even at ServiceNow, Functionally, it'll be different, right? Engineers who have to whiteboard and, and create products and get in rooms together to really think, think about things. Um, I think they'll be in the office more than maybe some of the back office fun- functions that can be in the office only a day or two a week. And so we're talking about it internally and talking about experimenting with new ways of working without coming up with one. But it'll be a It'll be a, a push pull with the employees to see what what makes sense. But I absolutely think that there's going to be a shift and a distributed workforce is going to be more and more relevant in the future, for sure. I recently was uh, part of a webinar for Slack. And one of the issues that came up was the difficulty in figuring out how do you establish this kind of informal sense of communication or community, as you were just alluding to. And I've had this question come up a number of times. And do you have any quick thoughts or advice on that, on how to do that? It's interesting. I think in this increasingly distributed and hybrid world that we're going to be looking at, um, you know, we've got to focus, companies are going to focus on creating these frictionless experiences, right? And, and, and how do we ensure that people are collaborating effectively and being productive, um, but at the same time coming together for moments that matter for a cultural perspective? We take culture really seriously at ServiceNow. It is, it's one of the reasons why I love this company so much because the culture is amazing. It's a very hungry and humble culture. And I think that thinking about ensuring that collaboration, ensuring that we're able to be together for, that mo- for, for the moments that matter, that, that we can still drive that, that same feeling of culture and that same feeling of collaboration and working together is, is, gonna, is gonna be really important. And so I don't have the answers right now at all. What I can tell you is that we are really focused on ensuring that we are taking a progressive approach to the future of work because we are a cloud first digital company, right? And we use our tools, we're customer zero for everything. So when we shifted 100% remote in 24 hours, we did it seamlessly, which is incredible. And so um, I just think that we've got to continue to think about digital investments that will ensure that level of 
productivity, that level of collaboration, employee experience just becomes more and more important, especially because great employee experience drives great customer experience. And so if you think about employee and workplace safety also is, is top of mind, right? And so I just feel like the future of work and digital investments are going to go hand in hand to ensure that collaboration is, hap- is happening a- effectively. You mentioned employee experience and customer experience. When I talk with CIOs, customer experience has really become one of the important topics. And I wonder, do you have any, can you share any thoughts from a CFO perspective on customer experience? ServiceNow is in the business of providing digital tools to help drive fierce customer loyalty and incredible customer experience. And I think you know, now more than ever, customer experience is, is, is so important, right? And I think that that will continue to be a huge priority for many companies. But I would also posit that employee experience. So we've been talking about customer experience for a long, long time now, but employee experience, I think, is, is becoming more important of a talk track in the vein and in the sense of great employee experiences help drive great customer experiences, right? When your employees are happy, when your employees love what they're doing, when your employees feel empowered and feel productive, they're going to drive fierce customer loyalty and, and, and fierce customer experience. And so I think more than ever, um, companies are realizing that they are interlocked, right? And driving incredible employee experiences are really going to help drive great customer experiences, drive strong NPS scores. Um, and so the more, I, I think you're, you're, you're going to see more digital investments on the employee side, as well as the, the customer side in the future. So we have another question from LinkedIn, and this is from Latif Ashakun, and he's a CIO. And he asks this, he says, what advice can you give from the CFO perspective to CIOs that need to transform, to modernize their ERP stack? And what should the CI do if the chief financial officer has not really bought into the quote, much needed change? First of all, I think talking to the CFO in, in ways and in terms that they understand, I think is really critical and important. And so uh, return on investment is always going to be kind of where, where I start. So you want to spend all this money. Okay. What's the benefit? What's the return on investment that we're going to get? And it needs to be a, a rational and reasonable return on investment. There needs to be solid business case behind it. Um, and I would t- try to turn operational types of metrics into dollars and cents. So what do I mean by that? So if you're looking to put in a, um, an onboarding or offboarding system in HR, that's going to really help drive lower attrition or you, you know wh- whatever operational metrics you're looking at, how do you turn that into, well, if my attrition levels change or go down by 10%, a recruiting costs go down, you know, what costs and, and, and turn that into dollars and cents that, that always really helps. Um, I think making sure that they're involved early. And so they're not blindsided by a huge um, investment ask that hasn't been planned for. Right. So long-term strategic two, three year planning horizons and what you need to do, um, over that period of time. So there's no big surprises. And so they can plan for it. That's always going to help the CFO get them buy in. And then just really understanding, um, what the overarching impact is to, to the business and articulating that. Well, um, I think it are what, what I would say is, uh, my, my top advice there. Let me ask you uh, one more audience question. This is from Elizabeth Shaw, who says, how do you determine how much to invest for each innovation initiative, given that everything will not succeed, not everything will succeed? And how do you tolerate the loss? And it's a complex question, but I'll ask you just to do it really fast. 
I go back to what I talked about earlier about those three horizons, right? And so how we do it at ServiceNow is 60% is innovation that we know we need. It's commitments that we've made to cut to customers, this security, um, you know, keep the lights. You got, yeah, you, you have to do it. Um, and then we do 30% of those emerging technologies that we expect to see innovation uh, and ROI in, in two to three years. And then the last 10% is kind of those bigger bets that, you know, you're not, you're not hundred percent sure are going to pay off. Um, I think it's really important to build those relationships with the CIOs, making sure that you are in, in an understanding what technology investments you're making, what the outcomes are expected. And the CFO's role is really to hold people accountable. Not everything is going to pay off and you need to know when to shut things down. Also, you need to know when to say, you know what, that's not going to work. Let, let me cut my losses sooner rather than, than later. But I, I like to bucket it in those 60, 30, 10 is, is how we do it at service. Now you are a female C-level executive what do we need to do to encourage other women and companies to accept women as board members, as, as members of the C-suite and just to create that kind of diversity? So that's two questions. So advice for the female leaders who aspire to be corporate leaders, I think is one question. So I'll talk there. So when I first started out in finance and I talk about this a lot, my, my dream was not to be a CFO. I never even contemplated that. I never thought it was possible, right? Because it might sound short-sighted now, but when I graduated university, there weren't female CFO role models out there. There weren't female CEO role models out there. What I did know is I wanted to be in business and I wanted it and I wanted job security. So the way I saw it, regardless of what's going on in the world, accountants are always needed, right? So I, I, I majored in accounting. And I, after graduation, I headed straight to Ernst & Young. And the education I got there was instrumental in getting me where I am now. But since then, my career trajectory has, has, not, has not been the normal kind of upward. It's kind of taken a weird zigzag at times, right? And so for me, it's been about growth and taking risks. And so what advice I give people is to encourage women to lean into opportunities and take on roles that stretch them and not be, not be afraid to move out of your comfort zone and to be out of your comfort zone. I can give an example. Um, I joined Revlon. And when I joined Revlon, their stock was at an all-time low. I think it was a dollar at the time. And they were going through a, a, a massive um, tra- transition and evolution. And I knew it was, but I knew it was going to be a meaty role that would allow me to grow and do things differently. And it was this international CFO role I had never worked internationally before, and I was only in accounting. And so it was a big risk, but they took a risk on me. I took a risk on them. And that journey ended up being amazing. And so I would just say, put yourself outside your com- comfort zone. Don't be afraid to take risks and, and have a career that is a little bit of a zigzag if, um, if those opportunities arise. And if they don't arise, then, then make them happen. Put yourself out there. Raise your hand for those stretch opportunities or those jobs that no one wants because when you're successful in them, um, it really helps. And what about getting more women on boards? You joined the board of directors of Roblox. So what about that? So joining Roblox, that just happened um, in April and it's a great honor and I'm so excited to help them achieve their vision of really enabling these shared experiences across online and and virtual worlds. And it's an industry that I don't have a whole lot of experience in. So I'm really excited to learn and to, and to, and to help give my expertise there. Um, You know, I think it's really important at ServiceNow, we hold strong to our diversity, inclusion, and belonging values, you know, diverse, inclusive, inclusive teams are where everyone belongs and contributes. It's really essential to the success of a company. And I think we need to bring this approach and thinking much wholeheartedly, much more wholeheartedly um, when it comes to board um, diversification. And I'm really proud that at ServiceNow, our board is actually comprised of 40% diverse members. And 
our board makes that a priority. And when you make it a priority, you, you can see the results. Um, I also think there's a much larger candidate pool. If boards change their strategy when it comes to adding new board members, what happens usually is a board member is going to retire and then they look to the other board members and look into their network to see who, who they think would, would, would be a, a, a good ad. But if we don't just look at the network of the current board members and look for fur- further afield and extend a broader net, um, I think it really will help drive more diversity. Does it, does it really have to be someone who was or is a current or former CEO or CFO? Can you extend it to a level below the C-suite? If you do that, you can get access to some really incredible talent. Um, I think you just have to be open to thinking about candidates and the candidate pool in, in a different way. But the board has to make it a priority. And um, I'm really proud that ServiceNow Board is doing that. And I think Roblox is a great example as well. And so more and more, hopefully you'll see more women and underrepresented minorities on, on, on boards in the future. What advice do you have for women who are listening, who want to join boards and they're feeling that kind of glass ceiling a little bit? As CFO, I was working with some of my, some of my investment banks, right? And they kind of know what, what board, what's going on in the boardroom. Um, and so I just made myself kind of, I put myself out there. I let people know, A, that I was interested and in looking for boards. There's more and more really incredible um, organizations that are focused on getting women on board. So I do my research and just let everyone in your network know that that's something that is interesting. Um, and I would just be open to different industries, be open to different types of boards. Um, You can always start on non-for-profit boards and understand how how they work. I actually did, I did that. I I was on the the board of Susan G. Komen Orange County for a while. Um, So we can start at non-for-profits, but I think it's just getting yourself out there, letting people know that you're interested um, and, Ask around, you know, put it, put it out there, your bankers, your lawyer friends, um, you know, the folks that actually know what's going on in, in, in the boardroom can really help you. All right. Well, that's been a fast conversation, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Gina Mastantuono, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been fantastic. I really appreciate you. Everybody, thank you for watching, especially the folks who asked questions. Your questions were great. Before you go, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so we can send you our newsletter and, you know, tell a friend and check out CXOTalk.com. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.